Warning, the profanity in this episode is of the most fucked up variety. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by My Sheets Rock, Hello Fresh, and by the new transubstantiated confection for kids who never want to finish their body of Christ, Cathol Licorice. From the makers of Jesus Pieces, Cathol Licorice, because the Vatican wants to put things inside your children. And now, The Scathing Atheist. We're Mark and Jim from Fallacious Trump, the podcast where we use the insane ramblings of America's racist grandpa to explain logical fallacies. We did the Farnsworth quote when we were just starting out almost four years ago, and now that we've hit our hundredth episode, it's become clearer than ever that we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men. It's June 23rd. And it's National Detroit-style Pizza Day. <laughs> because when you're America's least interesting city, Square is an identity. Least interesting. <laughs> like, D- Detroit's been lining up for good insults for years now, and you go with least interesting. I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Thomas Edison's, New Jersey, Ooh. Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is the Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, the foremost exporter of child molesters has strong opinions on which flags to fly. Ted Cruz warns us about the Chinese plot involving cartoon space lesbians. And Don Ford will be here to advance that plot. But uh, don't, but don't tell Ted. <laughs> but first, the diatribe. I play a lot of VR games in my spare time. When I quit smoking, Oculus breaks kind of took over for cigarette breaks. So now every hour or two, I'm going to push back from my desk. I'll reset my head with 15 minutes of Beat Saber or something, and I'll get back to work. Now, the ideal game for that situation is something that you can play in short bursts, you know, like 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there kind of thing, but also something that won't get boring the 50th time you play it. Because let's face it, that's a week and a half the way I do this shit, and these games are expensive. So The best way to keep these games from getting repetitive and too easy is to replace AI opponents with human ones, and that means that I find myself playing a lot of multiplayer matchup type games. Trust me, eventually this is about atheism. Now, one thing that makes this a bit awkward is that the overwhelming majority of random players in these games tend to be tween and teen boys, or or at least that's the overwhelming majority of the people who are talking. I get that girl gamers often choose between silence and harassment, especially in VR. So the voices you hear aren't always representative. But still, the impression you get is that you're running around at recess in some all-male boarding school. And that's kind of awkward when you're a 46-year-old guy, especially when so damn many of these games involve shooting or even punching other players. Doesn't matter how aware of the simulation I am, punching a nine-year-old in the virtual face so that he'll drop his frisbee feels pretty fucked up. But it's also, as virtually anybody who's played online games already knows, a recipe for toxicity. It doesn't take much to transport that recess feeling from the all-male boarding school to the island from Lord of the Flies. Now, here's what I've noticed, though. And this is all anecdotal, so take it with a grain of salt. But in my experience, there's a direct relationship between how toxic an online gaming community is and how old it is. See, I'm an early adopter in a lot of these games. I don't have to talk my mom into buying them for me or wait for my allowance to show up. So I'm very often among the first group of people that starts playing these games or starts playing the multiplayer mod they just added. And at that point, when they're new, the communities are almost always reasonably polite and helpful. Yes, one kid will show up now and again and start hurling around slurs and epithets, but they'll usually get booted or muted. But over time, the communities invariably get increasingly toxic until in an awful lot of cases, the game becomes almost unplayable. Okay, so now you're starting to see how this ties into atheism, right? So if you think about it, there's kind of a logical reason why this would happen. Even if the total number of trolls is relatively low, some people are going to have the misfortune of running into several of them, right? Like I think we all have our threshold of how much of this shit we're going to put up with, except, of course, the trolls. So over time, more and more of the non-trolls are going to reach their breaking point and give up on the game. And thus, the percentage of trolls will get higher and higher and push ever more people out. Now, ultimately, there is a breaking point here. You know, once a group is trolly enough, the trolls disperse because there's nobody left to be outraged at their bullshit. And at that point, 
the few people who persevered through that can start to rebuild the community. Of course, they do so knowing that if they're too successful, they're just going to reignite the cycle and start it over again. So in most instances, the community around these games are either small or toxic. But notice I said most. There are some that manage to escape that bait, and usually it's by being so fucking fun that people are willing to wait out the trolls and keep going anyway. See, when these communities turn into toxic wastelands, it's definitely the trolls' fault. They get all the blame. But when the trolls fail, the credit goes to all the people that stuck around and endured so that the decent people would always outnumber the shitty ones. Look, it's really hard to make online communities work long term, especially if the community has a low bar for entry. And if online games with millions of dollars invested in keeping a broad player base happy fall victim to this problem all the fucking time, you can guarantee atheist groups are going to have it, too. Hell, because of the contrarian nature of atheist activism, we probably attract a lot more troll-inclined folks than some random VR parkour tag game. And when you find yourself in an online group that's being invaded by trolls or otherwise shitty people, the inclination is to just fucking leave. You know, Not only are you saving yourself the stress of dealing with shitty people, but you're also disassociating yourself from a group that tolerates it. But therein lies the problem, right? Because if all the people who won't tolerate it leave, the group's overall toxicity becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, to be clear, I get that I'm speaking from a place of enormous privilege here. I'm a cisgendered, heterosexual, moderately well-educated, middle-class white guy in America, right? I'm not the target of any of the epithets and slurs that the trolls are tossing out. I'm not the victim of their bullying. So I get that it's way easier for me to stick it out. And and I wouldn't encourage anybody to remain in a group where they felt bullied, singled out, or even just stressed as all hell from putting up with it from being there. And I'll add the caveat that some groups are toxic from the top down, right? Like if the leadership of a group endorses that toxicity, it may very well be beyond saving so that you would have nothing to offer but your anxiety. And if that's the case, by all means, leave. But at the same time, communities are generally built from the bottom up. I know this from personal experience. When I go back and listen to the archives of this show, I'm embarrassed by some of the transphobic and homophobic jokes that we made, some of the decidedly unenlightened positions that we took early on. We grew as podcasters and as people because enough of our listeners were willing to overlook that long enough to send us an email, engage us in conversation, recognize that we weren't malicious, just stupid, and help us get less stupid. That set the tone for our community far more than the positions me, Heath, and Eli took. Now, of course, staying in the group doesn't help much if you're not speaking up or or at the very least supporting the people that do. You know, I, I belong to a lot of online atheist communities, and the only ones that seem to do well over time are the ones that are heavily, even aggressively moderated. You know, you're the ones that consistently err on the side of consideration. And honestly, some atheists bristle at that, and I get it. I understand why. Given the way religious people get offended by the very fact that we exist, we have a reasonable desire to protect our right to offend. But the best way to protect that right is to use it responsibly. Look, I get that the whole world is wrestling with the complications of social media and the correct balance for online communities, but atheists really need these things to succeed. For an awful lot of us, especially the ones that live in my neck of the woods, online communities are the only lifeline they have. So if you can help make them better, it's incumbent upon you to do so. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the ready and aimed to my fire, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to give the headlines a shot? Uh, wait till I get home? I feel like this is a trick <laughs> like Bugs Bunny's tricking me or something. Okay, three white guys on a podcast quoting Imagine Dragons. Yep, that's it. We've reached peak caucasity, my friends. Peak caucasity. We have, but I think that's because you just heard a phrase that originated with 18th century musketeers and immediately thought of Imagine Dragons. Yep. <laughs> that's peak caucasity. In our lead story tonight, given the political climate, the gerrymandering, and the current makeup of the Supreme Court, the only good news atheists ever really get is demographic. But we have some of that this week to open up on. Uh, Specifically, Gallup just released some data from this year's Values and Beliefs poll, and things are looking worse for God than ever before, with a record low 81% of Americans answering yes when asked if they believe in God. And no, by the way, I didn't do the awkward answered yes phrasing to hide a substantial number of not sure didn't answer responses. An unprecedented 17% answered with a definitive no 
which means that fewer than one third of American atheists know what that word means. Yeah, but don't worry. It's not like one fucking fifth of the population has representation in our government or anything. Like, yeah, it's no, not, crazy. It's nothing crazy like that. So, yeah, this was actually one of those surveys where the more you looked at it, the better the data got, because some amount of there are more atheists now data is always going to be, you know, old God believing people dying being replaced by young non-god believing people and, and and that's good news of course but that process takes a long fucking time to make real change especially given the way that octogenarians cling to power in this country you know that's wordy noah but it would make a great bumper sticker we'll give it a try we'll give it a try <laughs> but this poll showed drop-offs in god belief in every age demographic Every single one, even the ones that were far broader than the number of years it's been since the last time they asked this shit. OK, I do like the idea that the problem of evil Republicans is making Republicans think about the problem of evil and some of them lose their faith, I guess. Right. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that or it could be TikTok. I'm telling you, great recipes, hot girls dancing, kills God. It's the best. You guys got to get in there. There you go. No. In fact, the most striking thing about this survey <laughs> is that there was a significant drop compared to the 2017 data in every single demographic, age or otherwise. Right. Like like, like the drop off was steepest among young people and, and liberals and Democrats. But even like rural, married, conservative, Republican, non-college graduates over the age of 50 saw a dip. It's also worth noting that even among God believers, only about half of them think he's worth a shit. <laughs> According to Gallup's data, only 42% of Americans believe in a God that listens to prayers and intervenes on people's behalf. Interestingly enough, a whopping 28% say that he can hear the prayers but can't intervene. <laughs> so okay. okay. So more than half the God believers think it's just some asshole running a really bad simulation that has, like, baby cancer in it. And that's the basis of their religion. Apparently. All that is true for them. Yeah. My God is trapped in an impotent omniscience hell box by an even bigger God. Now I need you to respect that. <laughs> right. Yes. Now, of course, we should temper all of this with a reminder that 81% is still an overwhelming majority. God believers still outnumber us four to one. But, but the number is down 6% just in the last five years. And that's after hovering well over 90% from Gallup first thinking to ask this in 1944 until basically the year we started this show. I also want to note that in this survey, 4% of the people who answered that they attended church weekly or nearly weekly also said they didn't believe in God. So it's just it's worth remembering that there are still plenty of more folks in need of our help. I was going to say, come to us, people. We have a podcast for you. And in the due to Biden's news right now, what Christians want more than anything in the world is for you, podcast listener, not to vote. They are desperate for you not to vote. They're spending millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars to try to keep you from voting this year. And we got yet another reminder why this week, as Joe Biden signed an executive order to fight conversion therapy worldwide, as well as several other issues involving anti-LGBTQ discrimination. Well, and, and in case that's not enough, we should also point out that Democrats didn't institute immigrant kidnapping policies or try to overthrow the government either. Mm -hmm. Right. But maybe you're still not excited about Democrats like, you know, Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton. Now, a great way to help with that is um, go fuck yourself. <laughs> you go fuck yourself. Wait, where? But where? <laughs> All right. So for those of you unfamiliar, conversion therapy, sometimes called reparative therapy these days, is at best an unlicensed religious person telling you that you can be heterosexual if you try hard enough. And at worst, it's literally torturing children until they pretend to be straight. It's discredited by every major medical body, and it's illegal in all the sane states and countries. But as you already know, because you're listening to this podcast, not all the states and countries are sane. And that's why Joe Biden's order telling the Department of Health and Human Services to issue rules that ban the use of federal funds for programs that offer conversion therapy is so important. It doesn't just stop conversion therapy. It takes away their fucking money. Yeah. And like as depressing as it is to have to say so often, how the fuck wasn't that already the rule? It is a sign <laughs> at least that we're moving in the right direction. Exactly. Yeah, it's like the NFL dealing with Belichick and Brady, except instead of slightly deflating footballs, we're talking about hate crimes and pseudoscience yeah. funding. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much the same as dealing with Belichick and Brady, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's very similar. They're both Republicans. I fucking hate Yeah, exactly. 
But that's not all. The Biden administration is also encouraging the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, to classify conversion therapy as a, quote, unfair or deceptive act or practice, unquote. If that happens, it would require conversion therapists to offer consumer warnings. And let me tell you, it's a lot harder to sell people on your bullshit if you have to introduce your practice like a local pedophile who just moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> well, I mean, slightly, slightly. You know, I mean, Americans still spend $3 billion a year on homeopathy and $80 billion on cigarettes. But yes, it, like, <laughs> that's, it still is a positive and important move. I mean, we spend $80 billion on lottery, too. Yeah, you guys aren't playing the lottery. <laughs> anyway, finally, <laughs> way more I've got it all crypto. in cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah. So yes, <laughs> finally, the executive order also addresses discrimination against LGBTQ families looking to foster children. So again, as regular listeners to the show will know, the Trump administration loosened protections in this area, allowing adoption agencies that receive federal funds to refuse to work with same-sex couples or even just couples that aren't their religion. So Biden is calling backsies on that and going further to include withholding funds from discriminatory counseling services, discriminatory couples therapy, and more. Point is, I know it's frustrating sometimes to see if Joe Manchin thinks people deserve rights this week, but this, this executive order and the legislation around it is the kind of thing that can happen when you do, in fact, vote. It's not just preventing bad stuff. There is active good being done right now. And there is not a goddamn thing Mitch McConnell or the Republicans can do about it, except try to keep you home from the voting booth this year. And in C-word news, according to a decree by Bishop Robert McManus of the Diocese of Worcester, Massachusetts, a local middle school is no longer allowed to call itself Catholic anymore. Except, yes, they are, because it's just a word, and the church can't really do anything about it. <laughs> I'm Catholic. Now I'm not. Now I'm Catholic again. Back to this. There's nothing they can do. I can just <laughs> use the word however I feel like it. So this might sound like another stupid church thing, but it's more than that. It's also evil. It's like textbook evil because of the reason. Yeah. The reason the church is trying to take away their trademark name, non-trademark, is because the middle school is displaying a pride flag and a Black Lives Matter flag. That's what got the Catholic Church angry. The Catholic Church is officially against pride for the LGBT community and against Black Lives Mattering. So they got mad. <laughs> yeah, it's It still pisses me off that we ever need more of an argument than they think there's a too far in terms of opposing bigotry. Yep. <laughs> As a policy. And I look, I know I'm a broken record on this, but really, Catholic Church? You've decided to weigh in once again on the well-being of children. Yeah, You know, maybe I shouldn't have given up on my dreams of being a personal trainer. I feel like uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I might have missed out. I could do anger counseling. It'd be great. <laughs> so this all started when Nativity School of Worcester started flying the flags in response to a call by students to make the school community, quote, more just and inclusive. And when the diocese heard about that, they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> right. We are <laughs> unjust and bigoted, apparently. <laughs> Shit. You got to take those down right now, though. That's against our policy. Well, the school administrators, to their credit, completely ignored that stern warning about Catholic values. And then the diocese actually did, we're going to count to three as a way to amp this up, they issued one more warning at the end of May to the school. And then last week, oh, no. Bishop McManus signed a decree that actually claims they're taking away the word Catholic. It also says the school cannot celebrate mass or sacraments or sacramentals. They can't do fundraisers with diocesan groups and they can't be listed in the diocesan directory. They, Wait, it's been a yellow pages based threat. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, also, like, so so now the child rape settlement fund isn't going to get any of their charity dollars. That'll show them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Confusing. Hey, Catholic Church, when your entire business model is hoping people don't Google your beliefs, the last thing you want to do is tell people what you believe. <laughs> yeah. Bad move. So here's what we got from Bob the Bishop in his decree. He said, quote, the gay pride flag, that's his words, the gay pride flag represents 
support of gay marriage and actively living an LGBTQ plus lifestyle. Um, yeah, it does. Also, it passively does. doing any of that stuff is represented. <laughs> All I don't right. Know, that's Thank a weird you, sentence. Keith. Everyone's always talking about the gays who are getting married and fighting for rights. Someone needs to stand for the passive gays who are just rewatching Steven Universe and texting their group chat memes. Right. They matter too. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. That's important. So from there, McManus tried to address Black Lives Matter and the weird thing he did with the gay marriage and the flag. It got even worse. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. For this so much quote. worse. <laughs> quote, while the Catholic Church stands unequivocally behind the phrase Black Lives Matter and strongly affirms that all lives matter. Oh, so, Jesus oh Christ. my God. Oh, Very terrible. zero words. And just to be clear, the construction of this sentence, he's setting up a but. Right. He yeah. started with, we stand behind While that. we, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And then he said, all lives matter. And there's a but coming. Here it comes. Continuing. But, real quote, the BLM movement co-opted the phrase and promotes a platform that directly contradicts Catholic social teaching on the importance and role of the nuclear family and seeks to disrupt the family structure. Hey. The flying of these flags in front what? of a Catholic school sends a mixed confusing and scandalous message oh. to the public yep. about the church's stance on these important issues and exact quote. Sorry, is his claim that the Black Lives Matter movement stole the phrase Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matter yeah. <laughs> from the Catholic <laughs> Church's <laughs> platform? <laughs> because at a, at a certain point, Bizarro Superman is going to fly down and be like, okay, this a little much, man. <laughs> 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 or maybe he was saying they they co-opted all lives matter and we're like ours though to be I, I it it makes no sense either way. So following his big removal of a word from a middle school, Bishop Bobby spoke with the Catholic Free Press to explain himself. And I'm pretty sure he tried to claim that the ideas of pride and of black lives mattering are too Machiavellian. In his head, mm. he said, quote, while we all share in wanting our students, in particular, our black and brown inner city students to feel safe and welcome, we must abide by the moral axiom that the ends do not justify the means. End quote. Wow. Whoa. Well, so, so we want minorities to feel welcome, but not if it means devoting whole fabric rectangles to it. <laughs> She's a way to prioritize self-proclaimed moral arbiters. I know. It's, exactly, it's like it's more important to do it the right way than to get the good results. <laughs> I speak for God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's one other important detail here. The school is independently funded. And does not get any money from the diocese. But I'm pretty sure that Bishop Bobby didn't know that right away. I feel like the whole thing started with a phone call from that bishop. And he's like, hey, take down those flags or we're going to pull your funding. And school president McKenney, he said, y you don't give us funding. At which point Bishop Bob made a fake static noise and hung up and then <laughs> quickly typed up a decree about withholding an adjective and possibly a magical cracker brand. Is that what yeah. they were saying? That, like you can't mm -hmm. have the sacraments. Yep. So unlike almost every story about the Catholic church, this one landed on some good news. When the school got the final decree telling them to take down the flags, president McKenney responded approximate quote, um, make me. <laughs> and I think that's Catholic for go fuck yourself. Yeah. Which further demonstrates how the word is public domain. There you go. And the school is still flying the flags. So go fuck yourself. <laughs> all right. Well, shit, I have an unprecedented opportunity to chop things off and have an all good news segment if we do it now. So I'm going to take this opportunity to pause for a word from our first sponsor this week. My Sheets Rock. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. You know, these last two weeks, as I was on my vacation, my co-host did a lot of tossing and turning. What is Eli doing right now? Does he miss me as much as I miss him? He sure is the heart and soul of our podcast. And that would have led to a lot of sleepless nights. 
That is, if it weren't for the regulator sheets from My Sheets Rock. The regulator sheets are designed specifically to keep hot sleepers cool and cold sleepers comfortable. They regulate temperature, wick away moisture, stay breathable, and are so soft you'll sleep comfortably every night. That's because these sheets are made from best-in-class bamboo rayon, the holy grail of sheeting. This miracle material transfers body heat two times more effectively than regular sheets and reduces humidity by 50% so you can experience your best night's sleep yet. Even if the son slash brother you never had is on vacation. You are my son and my brother. Yes. But don't take my word for it. Listen to this very real testimonial from our own Heath Enright. My Sheets Rock sent us a pair to try, and they're so good at wicking moisture that the tears I cried while Eli was... Seriously? Lingered but a moment. <sighs> Lingered but a moment upon my sodden cheeks. Exactly. Okay. Don't believe me? Their five-star customer reviews speak for themselves. Plus, they offer a 90-day risk-free trial and free shipping and returns. Check out My Sheets Rock at MySheetsRock.com slash scathing and enter our code scathing for 10% off and free shipping. That's MySheetsRock.com slash scathing. Code scathing. My Sheets Rock. Almost as much as everyone missed Eli. You gonna let Don out of your trunk now? Oh, Don's in the trunk. I thought it was one of my cats. No, no, it's Don and a raccoon. Oh, well, then I'm unblackmailed then. Do you think he and the raccoon are friends now? I hope so, because they did not start out that way, let me tell you. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. When it comes to second-generation fundamentalist evangelical shit biscuits, Jerry Falwell Jr.'s job is to protect everyone else from being the shittiest one. And that's a damn good thing for Franklin Graham. This is the man who started his existence in Billy Graham's balls and somehow just got worse from there. And we already knew he was shitty based on the 12 separate entries under the controversy section of his Wikipedia page. I shit you not, it's like the bulk of his entry. And they have titles like support of the Iraq war, support for conversion therapy, and praise of Vladimir Putin. But he managed to get even worse this week when a story broke in the Washington Post all about him gaslighting a victim of domestic abuse and sending her back to her husband. Why? Because leaving him would threaten his cash cow. So the victim in question is Nami Panahi. Sorry if I'm fucking up that pronunciation. Her husband was a Christian pastor who was imprisoned in Iran. And between 2013 and 2015, Graham used his online platform to advocate for his release and to fundraise off of her misfortune by holding her and her husband out as exemplars of the rampant persecution of Christians around the world. But eventually he was freed, at which point Graham learned that she was being abused and didn't want anything to do with the guy. But since that fucked up his narrative, he tried to persuade her to stay with him. In fact, upon learning of the abuse, apparently his first response was to call Panahi and accuse her of cheating on him. I mean, why else would he continue to be the physically and emotionally abusive husband she said he'd been pretty much their whole marriage? Now, keep in mind that Graham could have used his enormous platform to highlight the dangers of domestic abuse. He could have offered her the same level of support she offered her husband. But instead, he urged her to stop talking about the abuse publicly and return to her abuser. In fact, in an email in the WAPO article, he says, quote, I'm not saying that your husband is not guilty of abuse. I'm sure he is guilty of much worse. The problem is you exposed him publicly to the whole world and embarrassed him, end quote. Yeah, that's the real problem with spousal abuse, how embarrassing it is to the abuser. Of course, the guys all buttered you up with good news and made me the first to do a headline about depressing shit. So let me close with something a bit more uplifting. On Tuesday of this week, the senior Buddhist authority in Bhutan began ordaining a group of 144 women as female monks, ending a practice of gender discrimination so pervasive in the tradition that nobody even knows how old it is. Everybody agrees that there were female monks in the time of the Buddha, but over time, the Tibetan wing of the faith kind of pushed them all out and placed a glass ceiling between them and the highest echelons of religious leadership. And apparently this was complicated a bit because becoming a female monk in Tibetan Buddhism is kind of like becoming a vampire. Only another female monk can turn you into one. So they had to like do extra magic, fly female monks in from other branches of the faith, all kinds of silly shit. 
But the end result is a step towards gender equality in a part of the world where royal women are still relegated to menstrual huts once a month. And that's definitely worth celebrating. So on that upbeat note, I'll take my leave and hand you back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in cruising for Chicks News, when it comes to Christian theocrats, it's important to remember that not all of them are stupid. No, some of them are evil pretending to be stupid so that stupid people will vote for them, which admittedly is kind of a short-term strategy and means you'll be remembered as a villain through history. So I guess it's also kind of stupid. Now I'm starting to doubt myself. Anyways, I'll leave that up to the philosophers. Either way, Ted Cruz is definitely some combination of those things as he took to his podcast this week to complain about lesbian toys, by which I mean toys which are lesbian, not toys for lesbians. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. The the sexual orientation of the toy itself. Yeah. That's what he took issue with this week. Okay. So the senator was whining about the Pixar movie Lightyear, Mm. which has already been banned in 14 (laughs) countries, including China, for featuring a gay kiss between one of the space rangers and her (laughs) wife. Okay. The other conservative freak out about this movie is my favorite, though. So Ted Cruz, yeah, he sucks. But people are complaining that Tim Allen wasn't in the cast uh of Lightyear because he got canceled by Hollywood for being a Republican. But... Tim Allen was playing the toy of Buzz Lightyear in those other movies. And the new movie is about the actual character of Buzz Lightyear that the toy was based on. And people are so confused by this. But but yeah, Ted Cruz, he's just being, you know, an evil bigot without the stupid. He's smart enough to know exactly what he's doing. (laughs) Exactly. So, yeah, after complaining that liberals are too willing to bend to China's will when it comes to economic policy, he added this, quote, but when it comes to their culture agenda, apparently now suddenly they've discovered, all right, give up the money because lesbian toys are more important, end quote. Adding, the last time I checked, most toys are kind of androgynous. They're usually without genitalia, end real quote from Senator Ted Cruz. Usually, I'm I'm sorry, what... (laughs) Was he cursed by some rogue birthday wish to have to negate every point he makes with the follow-up <laughs> points? <laughs> also, just want to be clear, a United States senator recently checked the crotch areas of his entire toy collection, yeah. <laughs> according to himself. And only usually found them without genitalia. I was going to say, and found at least one penis. <laughs> <laughs> or something. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff making it into Ted Cruz's brain these days. Uh, either way, we here at The Scathing Atheist know a great marketing opportunity when we see it. So let's put 30 seconds on the clock. Names for a new queer line of toys. Go. Uh, I'll go first. Transformers. Oh, there you go. Okay, well, we can do that. Then the bicycle. <laughs> um, Running with scissors. I feel like that's a fun game. Confusing. Now, love, Simon. Uh, how about... Polly Pocket. Ooh. Uh, Muddy Morphin Power Bottoms. Well done. And stretch Forearm Strong. Okay. Uh, what? Fisting. Rubik's <laughs> LGBT Cube. Okay. Well, we're talking about Ted Cruz. I think he'd vote for a Magic 8 Ball that says, don't ask, don't tell, no matter what happens. Fair. <laughs> Fair. Well done. And in Drain the Main Vein, but main like the state news tonight. The Supreme Court ruled on Tuesday that, contrary to the First Amendment, it was perfectly legal for state governments to directly fund religious indoctrination with taxpayer money. And what's more, it's illegal for them not to. Huh. Yeah. So as as Andrew so confidently predicted when we talked about this back on episode 461 in December, the court voted 6-3 to strike down the religious exclusion in Maine's law that allowed taxpayer money to be directed to private schools in rural areas. The law basically said, sure, look, we'll pay for the private schools in areas that are too sparsely populated to support public schools, provided they teach the kids real things in accordance with the state's educational requirements. But this fucking church state bizarro court ruled that that was religious discrimination (laughs) because of, you know, the real things provision being in there. (sighs) Yep. So the argument from John Roberts and the other five conservatives is that Maine's tuition program isn't neutral about religion because that program won't pay for a school that promotes a religion. 
Now, obviously, that should be the rule for like every single government program because of, you know, the First Amendment. But regardless, if Maine just made the language say no schools that teach a book with hate crimes, (laughs) it it would accomplish the exact same thing. Mm. Point being, you can switch out the phrase teach religion for teach a book with hate crimes. Those are interchangeable here. Someone needs to say that out loud during oral arguments next time and have like a yeah. chart, like a Venn diagram and have them <laughs> hovering next to each other. Right? Yeah. Honestly, I don't know how anyone arguing in front of the Supreme Court says anything except remember when you cried and yelled about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep, that's what I would be stuck on. <laughs> yeah. So despite the aggressive redefinition of discrimination that undergirds the majority's argument, Stephen Breyer summarized the problem pretty well in his dissent by pointing out that, quote, there is no meaningful difference between a state's payment of the salary of a religious minister and the salary of someone who will teach the practice of religion to a person's child, end quote. Hey, yeah, those are interchangeable, too. Yep, sure are. And in a blistering addendum, Sonia Sotomayor offered an additional dissent that read in part, quote, I goddamn told you so, Stephen Breyer, you motherfucking Trinity Lutheran turncoat jackass coward <laughs> idiot, end quote. Yeah, don't act like we don't remember. You did that. You did right. that. <laughs> right. Now you're dissenting. Great. Yeah. Well, actually, let me add a real quote from her because th- her whole dissent is fucking gold. Talking about this case in relation to Trinity Lutheran and, and Espinosa, she writes, quote, what a difference five years make. In 2017, I feared the court was leading us to a place where separation of church and state would be a constitutional slogan, not a constitutional commitment. Today, the court leads us to a place where separation of church and state becomes a constitutional violation. End quote. Not adding, remember when one of my colleagues cried and yelled about Hillary Clinton? <laughs> yep. Remember that? Maybe that guy shouldn't get the same number of votes as right? me. What do we think? Yeah. Huh? God. Yeah, God, he's like, he's the electoral college of the Supreme Court. And look, <laughs> as atheists, it's easy to look at this through the lens of just the ongoing attack on separation of church and state. But it's worth emphasizing that this shit is happening at the same time that Republicans are attacking schools for not being racist enough and conservative pundits are calling public school teachers groomers without apology. This decision is part of a multi-pronged attack by the religious right on the very concept of publicly funded education. Right. They're running a pincher movement against the population knowing things. Mm -hmm. Just I thought I'd emphasize that in case you were insufficiently terrified by the future. (sighs) And finally, tonight in just the Q-tip news, (laughs) the anti-vaxxer list of excuses got even dumber this week with a religious objection to cotton swabs. Yep. This actually happened. So after the argument that COVID vaccines contain the metaphysical essence of a ground up Dutch fetus (laughs) from 1978, I thought we'd hit rock bottom (laughs) of human thought, but apparently not. A group of 35 Christian cops from the San Diego, California Police Department who already got religious exemptions to the vaccine mandate are now demanding that they're exempt from even being tested for COVID because cotton swabs are a violation of their sincerely held Christian belief that God made us perfect without any extra stuff going in our nose or whatever. (laughs) Okay, guys, if you believe in bodily autonomy, I have some terrible news for you about being a cop. This is really... (laughs) No, no, so they they believe in bodily autonomy for them, Eli. Like like their autonomy over their and other people's bodies. Mm -hmm. Right. And and to be fair, like that's pretty consistent with Christian beliefs going back to the dark fucking ages. So yeah, bodily autocracy. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) So the city of San Diego decided to let I like book be an exemption to the vaccine for public safety workers who walk around all over the place. Already homicidally stupid. But the rule says that those people have to get regular testing. And testing is a sciencey thing, also known as persecution of Christian people. So they're demanding the religious liberty to secretly have a highly contagious disease while they interact with the public all over the city. According to a recent review of the exemption forms by KPBS, these cops are claiming that their Christian belief system tells them that they can't use the swabs because they contain ethylene oxide, which is potentially carcinogenic, depending on the amount. 
but I'm pretty sure the danger range doesn't include zero, which is how much ethylene oxide is actually <laughs> present in a swab. That chemical is used in gaseous form to sterilize swabs. Oh, Jesus so, Christ. You know how you don't get liver cancer from a scalpel that was disinfected with alcohol when you get <laughs> surgery? It's like that. Or drunk. Yeah. yeah well, so look, also, you can't simultaneously voluntarily breathe the air in Southern California and pretend it's against your religion to take in carcinogens, okay? <laughs> That's fair. Yep. Yeah, so based on that review of the forms, it became pretty clear that these cops were all working off the same anti-vaxxer group cheat sheet that was provided to them. Mm -hmm. Multiple forms had the following exact words. Quote, because of my deeply held Christian beliefs, I trust in God's perfect design of my body and that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The COVID-19 vaccine and the nasal swab test with ethylene oxide. No, it doesn't are an unneeded introduction of drugs slash chemicals into my body, end quote. Well, they, I mean, they've got us there. Q-tips are made from chemicals sure so, entirely. So you guys would be willing to undergo drug tests for other illicit chemicals, including alcohol, right? Oh, where are you all going? You're all free, <laughs> guys? Guys? So you might be thinking at this point, okay, I've read the Bible. I don't remember the section where God complained about ethylene oxide. <laughs> yeah, there isn't one. But that didn't stop a bunch of these cops from trying to pretend there was a section about that. Several cops, again, from that same cheat sheet, cited the same passage from 1 Corinthians when God says something about, you know, your body should be treated like a temple. But that passage is about sexual immorality. So... Uh, apparently these cops were very confused about how to use that swab <laughs> or some anti-vaxxer group made up a new lie and a bunch of cops were happy to use it so that they can have COVID secretly while they yep. walk around town. Yeah. Yeah. And again, if, if you have an issue with sexual immorality, I've got some bad news about being a cop. <laughs> it's just, uh, <laughs> All right. Well, I guess now that we're all a little more convinced that we could successfully use sovereign citizen arguments to get out of a ticket in San Diego, I guess we can close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Maritime law. And when we come back, Anna will spoil you motherfuckers rotten. Hey, Heath, your box delivery food is here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I guess. What's the matter? I thought you loved those meal delivery services. Yeah, no, I do. It's just, they get kind of samey after a while. Well, why don't you try HelloFresh? Carl the Pug of Pegacorn? What are you doing here? Shows weren't weird enough while I was gone. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. And if you're worried about variety, HelloFresh now has 30 dinner recipes to choose from every single week. That's the most choices of any meal kit. Wow, that's lots of choices. But that's not all. Customize your favorite dishes with new Hello Custom offerings. By swapping out one protein or side for another, upgrading for a more luxe experience, or even adding protein to a veggie meal. That means more choices, more variety, and more meals truly tailored to you. Sounds amazing. It is. HelloFresh sent us a box to try, and it was so delicious that I, Eli, became a paying customer. Go to HelloFresh.com slash scathing16 and use code scathing16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. HelloFresh.com slash scathing16 and use code scathing16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. All right. Thanks, everybody. This is, this is somebody's first episode. Welcome to the jungle, baby. Okay. You know, it was 222 episodes ago when we first started to work our way through the Bible with a monthly segment where we act out key scenes complete with funny voices. And I'll admit that it seemed at the time like the task was just too big to ever get through. But I'm pleased to say that after a brief four years and three months of pecking away at it, we're finally more than halfway through the, the, the Old Testament because we're cheating. And on that depressing factoid, we'll begin this month's installment of Bible Peace Theater. 
But then he makes a post like duetting her video and explains that they weren't even dating at the time she's describing uh, in her original video. Okay. I don't want to say I'm not surprised you spent your entire vacation getting caught up on TikTok drama, but I'm deeply unsurprised you spent your entire vacation getting caught up on TikTok drama. Okay, but did you see her Insta post about the video? Because No, she has an Insta post oh, about it? Oh, big time. Yeah. Damn yeah. It, Don, you too, really? What? Uh, I'm not allowed to go on vacation either? Hey, guys. Are you guys ready for Bible Peace Theater? Oh, the part of the show where we act out the Bible so our listeners don't have to read it? Yeah. Please, anything but the TikTok drama that apparently... Uh, oh, you guys, you guys are talking about the breakup video? <laughs> oh, yeah. So brutal. in the universe. All right, where were we? Uh, Chronicles. Nice. So uh, what happens in Chronicles? Well, basically, it's the exact stories as we've done before, but with less detail. Okay, come on, guys. I know the Bible can be a little repetitive, but that's the whole point of this segment. We have, you know, we'll liven it up with songs and skits and wacky characters. But uh, no, I, we get it. But but Eli, it's literally it's the same stories again with with just the names, basically. Like literally, yeah. Come on, let, let me see that. Oh wow, it, it literally just starts with a list of names. As, yeah, no, that's what yeah. we said. Yeah, like two weeks of vacation. Just peek ahead at the Bible. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. You know what? We can do this. People always say, oh, I could hear you guys read the phone book, right? So now's our chance. Adam, Schiff, Enosh. Wait, seriously? You're, you're going to read that? There was a swoosh. We're in the sketch now. We're in a sketch now. Kenan, Mehalil, Jared. Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech. Guys, guys, people are just going to fast forward. Yeah. Probably did that when we introduced Bible Peace Theater anyway. A lot of people. How dare you? Give me your nipples. Guys, guys, it's fine. It's a big list of names yeah. and an extended last time on montage. We're, we'll just, we'll skip both of the chronicles and, and move on to Ezra. Fine. Thank fine. you. Did, did you just say, give me your nipples? Yeah, he did. Those are his fighting words. It's true. It's true. Weird. You're weird. Right. So at the end of Chronicles and the other parts of the Bible, the king of Babylon comes and kidnaps all the people of Israel and more importantly, destroys the temple of David and steals all his treasure. And that's where things remain until King Cyrus of Persia gets a visit from God. People of Israel, hear me. Yes, King Cyrus. I've heard from your God who has given me dominion over all the earth. And he has told me, uh, excuse that, uh, me, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, yes, I'm uh, kind of doing a thing here, what? Uh, no, 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 I know you are. I, I just wanted to point out that even at this time, the King Cyrus would be aware that he wasn't king of everywhere on Earth. I mean, there's historical records okay, of it, trading it, it, with it, It's a metaphor? It's a metaphor. Anyway, God told me that he'd like to build a great temple in Jerusalem... And any of you that wish to go back to Jerusalem to build that temple may go freely. Oh, okay, but what if we don't want to go? Um, then give all your money and goods to the people going, and you can stay here. Well, that's not much of a choice. All our gold and silver? Hey, do you guys want a temple or not? I, I, I guess so. It just seems like if God wanted us to have a temple... He wouldn't have let you guys destroy it in the first place, you know? Yeah, actually. Okay, yeah, solid point. Solid. But tr trust me, he's got a really good uh, Kickstarter video, and he's going to make it happen this time. Wait, totally. Seriously, a Kickstarter video? Yes. Those can be very convincing. You're just saying that because you bought the Fitbit that counts your calories. Wait, there's a Fitbit that counts your calories for you? No, there's not. No, there is not. So a bunch of Jews return to Israel with their gold and silver and animals and get ready to form the temple. Okay, everyone, uh, before we get digging, is anyone here a priest who can do all the, you know, like the blessings and stuff? Anybody? You gotta be fucking kidding. Nobody here is a priest. Babylonians fucked up our genealogies when they kidnapped us. Oh, right. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. You know what? We'll use the Urim and Thummim. What are those? Uh, they're uh, the magic rocks. Uh, they'll tell us who is and isn't a priest. I thought that was a Mormon thing. Uh, well, they, uh, they stole it from us. Okay, so uh, how does it work? Okay, so either you reach in a box and grab one of two rocks, or you can read the light coming off of the gem in a chest plate to determine messages from God. 
Those two things seem wildly different. Yep. Yep, they sure are. So, uh, but we're, we're going to do the rock one. Do we get to look? No, of course you don't get to look. All right. Everybody, now that, um, would you look at that? Statistically, about 50% of us turned out to be priests. Weird. So I guess now we can build that temple. Hooray! Hi, hey. Wait, so I, what the fuck was that? The Bible says everyone sang, shouted, cried, wept, and praised the Lord. Oh, well, that, that just seems like a kind of a weird mix of reactions, doesn't it? Take me home! Hey, thank you, Alan. I'm just confused why you get to be the putty guy and I have to be the brick guy. Okay, if it's that problematic, after lunch, we'll switch. Oh, the least sweaty part of the day is when oh. we'll switch. Oh, no, God. no don't hurt comes. yourself bending oh. over backwards for me or anything. Oh, hey, I'm hey, Juice. sorry. I... Hey, Juice, what, what are you guys up to? Oh, we're rebuilding the Great Temple. Well, I am. He's mostly spreading putty. Oh, okay. Want. Not in front of the guys, okay? Well, that just, sounds can we... swell. Can, can we help? Eh, no. Nah, nah, we, yeah, we, we're good, we're good. All right, well, that leaves me no choice but to call on the non-Jew's greatest weapon. <gasps> A fully erect spine. <gasps> the ability to tan? No. The H-O-A. All right, thank you, Grant. Okay, next up. The uh, the Jews have a petition for the HOA board led by King Artaxerxes. Jews, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we, we got a summons to this board about an unlicensed structure. Right. Yeah, that's your new temple. Yeah? Yes, we were building it for God. For God, totally. Yeah, the problem is you actually need approval to build anything over three feet on the property or... Anything that's within 12 feet of your property line's sight line. What does that even mean? Uh, it's pretty much anything. Anywhere on your property. You can't do it. Uh, okay, so how do we do that? Well, you write a letter of intent to the board, and then we'll vote on it at the next meeting. Okay, but since we're all here right now, can we just ask you now? Mm, and no. then you can say yes no. or no now. No, no, sorry, you got to do the letter. Okay, well, what will you do if we don't follow your rules, huh? Well, we would, at that point, write you another letter, so... No, uh, no uh, uh, to what end game? Like, if we ignore you forever, what happens? I mean, nothing, I guess. We're, we're not like the government. We're, we're just a board created by the neighborhood that tells you what to do. I'm sorry, I, I just need to clarify. Uh -huh. The HOA yeah. is just guys. Just guys, yes, that's that's it. Who sent us a summons. Yes, yes. Yeah, we did. Uh, not a legally protected term. Yes, summons if we want. Oh, this is the worst thing that will ever happen to the Jews. I was just thinking that. Thank oh, you. go on. Okay, so then what happened? Well, the Jews keep building the temple anyway, so King Darius writes them a letter checking to see that they have the proper paperwork. Sorry, there's a section of the Bible about checking... Like building permits and stuff? Yeah. No, it's like it's two whole chapters. I am astonished by the new lows of boredom this book manages to get me to. Right? So th the Jews head back to Jerusalem, which is where we meet Ezra, the priest and scribe. Jews, hear me. It is I, Ezra. I bring a letter from King Anaxerxes, who bids us rebuild our temple. Uh, we already did that. Oh. You did? Okay. Did you do the gold and silver thing? Yes, we did that too. Did you find the priests? Aren't you a prophet? Okay, no. I'm literally just a priest and a scribe. I read and write letters. Oh. That's lame. You're lame. Ezra. Yes, Prince of Jerusalem. The priests and people of Israel have taken foreign wives for themselves, and God is very offended by that. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. Dude, 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 what are you doing? What, what's happening right now? Oh, I'm plucking out all my hair and my beard. Um, I mean, yeah, I see that. Okay. Just, wow. Okay. I feel like this is going to take a while, so yeah, we're going to go. Uh, all right, I'll see you later, man. Uh, uh. This book is weird. 
All right, everybody. I talked to God, and he doesn't like the marrying of the non-Jews, so everyone has to divorce their non-Jewish wife. Oh, come Seriously? on. I know. I know. We're all going to miss being able to do mouth stuff, but it's the word of God. And if you don't give up your non-Jewish wife, you got to give up all your stuff to the temple. Okay, okay. So it's mouth stuff or all our worldly goods? Exactly. What, seriously? You guys are taking... I'm thinking. Yeah, man, don't rush This is a tough one. And that's it. That's, uh, that's Ezra. Wow. Not, uh, not much to that one. Yep. Hard to kind of take a lesson away from that book, I think. Well, hit it, Anna. Yet another book devoted to making it hard for a biblical poet Cause they built this temple and then corruption Tore it down, can they build it up again? Build it up again Shifted and shipped it to Babylon. Rulers were bankers and smithies and merchants and jewelers. Bought it all so the kingdom could get soldiers to take even more of their shit. Their temple was gone and a few were desirous to rebuild. So they went to King Cyrus. He sat through their spiel and to their amazement provoked, he revoked their terms of enslavement. Build it up. What? Build it up. Build it up. Not. Yes. With a word from their sovereign, the exiles finished Their wealth, their health, their passion diminished They went back to Judah with singers and priests Anointed the temple with bloodthirsty feasts Gathered up mortar, lumber, bricks Rot row Judah surrounded by dicks Rahum looked on the Jews with disdain So he started a vicious letter campaign Build it up Spreads rumors and lies Build it up And shows them no mercy Build it up Slows down so many Jews you think Build it up govern New Jersey Build it and up And their situation Build it most up. precarious Build it up they got a reprieve from King Darius. So the temple was finished with minimal skirmishes built in its glory. It was all right, and if this weren't the Bible, then that'd be the end of the story. Ezra be totally chill to reclaim the most holy of places. But you can't be a biblical hero if you're not a complete and total racist. He heard that some had taken foreign wives. He laments, repents, and then he throws their lives. Since God's a bigot, they do. But let's not be too hasty, my friend, because before the plot can get tasty again, the temple's been flattened and rebuilt before. Let's see if we can't do it three or four times more. Build it up. And tear it down again. Build it up. Build it up. Before we pull down the security gate tonight, I wanted to make sure that you knew that Eli Heath and I were going to be at the QED conference in Manchester, England on October 29th and 30th. We're going to be doing a live gam record. We're going to be hanging out all weekend. We might be on a panel or something. Anyway, it's going to be a great time. It always is. Tickets are on sale now. Look for a link in the show notes for this episode. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be able to look out for a brand new episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 noon Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half sister show citation needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Stay. Obviously, I can't rest the pipes before I thank Heath Enright for running up that road, Eli Bosnick for running up that hill, and Lucinda Illusions for running up that building. Hers sounds way more impressive than yours, guys. Sorry. I'd like to thank Kate Bush for admitting even back then that she could not, in fact, make a deal with God. I want to thank Don Ford for being a kind and thoughtful person. I also need to thank Anna Bosnick for being all the stuff I said about Don and extremely talented. Sorry, Don, nobody ever accused me of being kind and thoughtful. Also want to thank Mark and Jim from the Fallacious Trump Podcast for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. Be sure to check the show notes to hear more from them. And, and they actually said that a little while ago, so expect to find more than 100 episodes when you get there. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most mellifluous mammals, Doom Caleb, Mark Fortuna, Angie, Nova Kane, Maurice, Tom, and Alex, the Space Ace, whose name I got wrong last week. Apologies. Doom Caleb and Mark, whose IQs are so high that their thoughts get vertigo. Fortuna, Angie, and Nova Kane, who are so bright, people flash their high beams at them when they think too hard and Maurice, Tom, and Alex, who are so hot, the Parker Solar Probe needed a shield on the other side, too. Together, these nine notably knowledgeable non-believers nudged some numismatic niceties near our nest eggs this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage 
pages, scathingadius.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark. We'll sort of all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. That's the only. Good news. Oh, well, that's, yeah. Okay. yeah, it turns out you're allowed to put only before any number. Yeah, it's done. true. It's not legally protected. So <laughs> I, I too have been watching the January 6th. <laughs> <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.